Chapter 17, Grand Portage. By the time Charbonneau's crew finished unloading, the rest of the brigade had tapped a brandy keg. If you don't care to pickle your brain, Charbonneau offered, I'll show you the grounds. They walked beyond the stockade to the encampment. Pierre was surprised to see two separate camps with a rushing creek between them. One was for the pork eaters, the men who headed back to Montreal before autumn. The other was for the hibernants, the men who wintered in company outposts to the north. Why two camps? Don't they talk to each other? Pierre asked. Charbonneau laughed. Pierre was amazed at how relaxed the man was this afternoon. They talk just fine, he answered. The problem is their talk always leads to fighting. Hivernons like to boast, and the worst of the whole lot are the Athabascans. The company keeps them apart so they won't kill each other. Pierre nodded. His father had told him many stories about the Athabascans, the company of voyagers who were legendary for their strength and endurance. Their standard packs were 110 pounds, and they were hired for five-year terms. They bragged constantly and liked to prove their toughness in fights with the other voyagers. Up the hill behind the fort, Charbonneau stopped and announced grandly, Here it is, the carry that everyone talks about, Grand Portage itself. Pierre looked up the nearly vertical path. One day, Charbonneau continued, you'll be proud to tell your grandchildren you stood here. Fort Charlotte and the Pigeon River are nine miles off, but what makes the trip so brutal isn't the distance. There's a 300-foot rise between here and there. The company tried horses and mules, but they decided it was cheaper to make men lame. Pierre imagined the agony of such a carry and was glad to be a mere pork eater. The toughest portage on the Ottawa was nothing compared to this. The Hivernons had good reason to brag. Charbonneau led Pierre toward a maze of birch bark wigwams. Let me introduce you to a few of my friends, he said, grinning like a man who had been too long absent from home. As they approached the ledge of the Indian encampment, two men were wedging a long sheet of sewn birch bark between two rows of stakes that followed the rough outline of a north canoe. One of the men nodded to Charbonneau, but both kept working. Stones were piled on top of the bark sheet sheeting to help form the hull. The men were getting ready to lash the gun walls to the top of the bark with cedar root lacing. Next, they'll fix the ribs in place, Charbonneau explained, and then the thwarts and seats. That's all there is to it? Pierre asked. Just a few days drying and she'll be ready to caulk. Pierre looked at the graceful lines of the hull. He guessed the finished craft would be around 25 feet long. Are the North Canoes faster than a Montreal? Pierre asked. Not only faster, but easier to portage and maneuver. The Ojibwa have been perfecting these boats for centuries. You can w run white water that would starve in a lake canoe. Charbonneau was tracing the curve of the hull as he spoke. Why, I remember one day when we were running the Namakin River... Suddenly, there was a war whoop behind them. Pierre whirled to see a tall Indian smothering Charbonneau in his arms. At first, Pierre thought his companion was being attacked, but then he saw Charbonneau grin. As he squeezed Charbonneau tight, the Indian sang out, Charbonneau, you old bone shaker! They pushed each other back to arm's length, and Charbonneau had a chance to speak. So, how was your winter, Mukwa? Pierre had never seen anything like Mukwa. To keep from laughing, Pierre covered his open mouth with his hand. The brave wore a wide-brimmed hat with a sash wrapped around the crown, holding three ostrich feathers high above his head. A silk handkerchief was tied at his throat, and a red checkered shirt showed beneath his blue waistcoat. Lace was pinned to the shoulders and sleeves of the coat, and he wore dark burgundy knee breeches. Though he didn't wear shoes, Pierre noticed a gray sock on one foot and a red on the other, each held up by a silk garter. You know the winters, my friend, Mukwa re replied. The game goes a little farther out each year, but we survive. The Indian spoke excellent French. He grabbed Charbonneau by the shoulders again. It is good to see you, Charbonneau. 
They squatted on the ground and visited a while longer, sharing news of the past year. After Charbonneau explained Lalonde's death, he said, We better get back to the fort and report in. I understand, Makwa said, but you must promise to feast with us before you leave this place. I'd be flattered. We will talk of old times, he said, and bring your little friend. He can meet my daughter, Kaniwa. Now, off with you. As soon as they were out of earshot, Pierre showed his anger at being called a little friend. Where did he ever where did he ever get an outfit like that one? he sneered. He is the chief. He wears what he wants. A chief called Makwa? Makwa means bear in Ojibwa, Charbonneau explained patiently. The bear is a powerful spirit animal. As a member of the bear clan, he could tell you many stories, but according to custom, winter is the only season to share the old legend. He stopped. Since Alain's death, Charbonneau's gruff military manner had softened, and Pierre appreciated the way he often went out of his way to explain things. But I always thought Indian chiefs wore headdresses and buffalo robes, Pierre explained. Makwa wears what his people regard as the finest dress of the civilized world. Bright clothes are a sign of wealth. The traders encourage it too. They're always willing to swap a bit of lace or a handkerchief for pelts. So the chief gets a little bit gaudier every year. Do all the chiefs dress like that? No, Charbonneau chuckled as he replied, though you do run into a showy fellow now and then. Farther inland, the Indians dress as they always have. The men wear breech clouts, beaded leggings, and moccasins. The women, he paused for the slightest moment, the women wear the softest doe-skin shifts you could ever imagine. They're all decorated with tiny beads and colored grasses and quills. In the winter, they wear rabbit-skin robes. Charbonneau looked at Pierre's intent face. We'd better check in with McKay before he decides we've run off to parts unknown. As they made their way back down the rocky hillside, Pierre tried to picture an inland village such as Charbonneau described. The dark-eyed women in their beaded doeskin dresses sound like the perfect visions from a dream. As they neared the stockade, Pierre saw that Grand Portage had come alive. Though only two dozen men had greeted them that morning, there seemed to be a thousand people milling around the stockade now. Charbonneau scoffed. <laughs> Looks like the rascals have crawled out of bed. All it takes is the scent of rum to roust them out. That night, a magnificent banquet was held in the great hall. Traders, clerks, and interpreters crowded along the plank tables, heaped with honey-glazed ham, venison, smoked trout, bread and butter, peas, Indian corn, potatoes, and fresh milk. Mr. McKay and the other Northwest Company officials sat at the head table, but except for some fancy bottles of wine, their fare was no better than that of the men from the brigades. Six weeks of corn and salt pork had left Pierre ravenous for real food. Of all the elegant dishes placed before him, he savored the garden peas and milk most of all. He'd scorned vegetables back home, but the sweet, buttery flavor of the fresh-picked peas stirred his senses to a level of delight only surpassed by the thick, cream-topped mugs of milk. When his belly was full, Pierre sat back, a picture of contentment. From across the table, Emile gave him a broad grin and said, Do you suppose we could get Bellegarde to stop by the kitchen for lessons? They'd throw him out on his ear, Pierre said, chuckling. Or at least make him take a bath first, Emile added. As soon as the meal was over, Pierre was surprised to see the men carry the tables to the far end of the room. A bagpipe, fiddle, and flute appeared. And just as the music started, some young Indian women showed up at the door. Dressed in their Sunday best, the men picked out partners and bowed. Beloit, being slower than his mates to notice the women, nearly trampled two fellows en route to the door. Displaying a cavalier spirit, he dropped to one knee before the lady of his liking. Pierre watched with pity, imagining the horror that would fill the girl's eyes when Beloit lifted his scarred face. Watch this, Pierre whispered to Charbonneau. That girl will scream for sure when she sees this ugly mug. 
To Pierre's surprise, the pretty girl smiled and nudged the friend beside her. When Belait offered his arm, he and his chosen promenade proudly to the dance floor. Did you see that? Pierre was shocked. What, Beloit and the girl? Yes, she's so pretty and he's... An awful mess, Charbonneau offered, chuckling at Pierre's astonishment. It's a different world up here. Scars are a fact of life in the wilderness. They're badges of honor, tokens of a life lived hard and well. Pierre was still shaking his head in disbelief when he felt someone tap his shoulder. He turned to see a pretty Indian girl standing beside him. When she said something in Ojibwa to Pierre, Charbonneau bursts out laughing. What'd she say? Pierre asked, embarrassed by the sudden attention. She says she wants to dance with the handsome young Frenchman, Charbonneau translated. Apparently, all the young girls are talking about you. They like your blonde hair and your big muscles. I thought you were an honest steersman, Pierre said. That's what the lady said. Are you serious? Believe what you want, Charbonneau replied, but be polite. She's waiting for an answer. Uh, Pierre was flustered. Tell her that I don't know how to dance. Charbonneau grinned. He turned to the girl and spoke. When he finished, she took Pierre's hand and led him onto the floor. Pierre glared back at Charbonneau, who grinned innocently. Don't look at me, he said. I only told her that you love dancing even more than paddling your canoe. He laughed then as Pierre disappeared among the whirling men and women.